that guy for me, I'll eat your f***ing eyes out of your head. I give as loyal as a mother. I think I'll fall inside the cow. Hey, Frank, you got to be kidding me. Hey, In the 1930s, New York's prominent mafia was under the control of Charles Lucky Luciano. But when he was out of the picture, there was one question. Who would take over power? Lucky Luciano used Vito Genovese as his intimidator. He also used Frank Costello as his diplomat. Luciano would use intimidation if he had to, but if he preferred Costello's approach but he would use intimidation. No one wanted the job more than Genovese, but it went to Costello, who quickly became a prominent member of society. Frank Costello was unusual as a, as a organized crime figure or a mafia figure, whatever you want to call him, uh, in that he fashioned himself as a non-gangster. He fashioned himself as a businessman, uh, sometimes bordering on aristocracy. Uh, and he would rather run with the counts and dukes and earls than he would with the capos and the tutti capis and the rest of them. Costello styled himself as the Mafia Prime Minister. But when push came to shove, could he hold his own when it mattered? Against the Senate? In the early 1950s, when a senator from the state of Tennessee was trying to make a mark, trying to make, get, some motor, get some publicity, uh, launched hearings. His name was Estes Kefova. He launched hearings into actually gambling. Big time gambling in the big cities. This is Mafia. Frank Costello was born in Italy. He arrived in East Harlem with his parents in 1900 at age four. His father ran a grocery shop but Costello didn't want to settle for a life of poverty. His brother Edward got into the life of street crime, and Frankie soon followed suit. Selwyn Rabb is the author of Five Families. Costello, like so many other uh, mobsters, started out uh, the young man with the teenager and then people in the young 20 street gangs, predatory street gangs, robberies, uh, knockoff, uh, passing... Uh, a pedestrian we thought had a good watch on him or a wallet, a thick wallet. He shook down uh, merchants, uh, petty anti stuff. Costello did well as a petty crook, but at age 24, he made one detrimental mistake. He was arrested for carrying a gun, and he was sentenced to a year in jail. New York had a very tough uh, gun law at the time, and still does, called the Sullivan Law, which meant a long stretch in prison if you got uh, arrested with a gun on you. So he decided uh, prudence was a better part of courage and uh, avoiding sentences. So whatever he did, he didn't do with a gun. He might have batted around people, but for the most part, he was more gentlemanly and uh, more civilized. The jail time may have been short, but the event would become important later in life. From that point forward, Costello never carried a gun. Costello realized that he needed to use his brains, not bullets, to get ahead of the pack. Like so many other young mobsters in the 1920s, they saw their opportunities when uh, Prohibition came along. Somehow or other to serve the uh, American public with good booze or bad booze. In fact, he was so successful, he was pretty slick in how importing booze, transporting it, and effectively getting it to the clientele. Um, so there was a lot of dough to be made. There were a lot of presumably respectable people involved in it. And he learned business dealings that way, uh, which set him apart from being a goon. He would never be a kind of hitman, goon, a muscle man type. He was a gentleman gangster. He was never going to be a thug. It was during the Prohibition that Costello teamed up with underworld hotshot Charles Lucky Luciano and his mismatched gang of up-and-comers. And it was there that he met Vito Genovese. Like Costello, Genovese had emigrated to the United States as a child and been in gangs from a young age. Genovese was from Naples. Genovese came over as a young man uh, to New York, grew up in the slums of New York. And from the beginning, he was involved in these what were then called street gangs. 
terrifying street gangs, violence ruled, and he never changed. That was the way he started, and that was the way he would end. Well, he was always he always believed that the uh, gun or the knife was more powerful than persuasion. So his early schooling led to his character for the rest of his life. Genovese had also spent a year in prison for firearms, but he still very much favored guns. He was colleagues with Luciano, but was employed by the mob boss Joe Masseria, where he mostly acted as an enforcer and executioner. Vito Genovese was never anything but a homicidal maniac. I mean, he was from the uh, really uh, violent school of the mafia. Killings to him were just uh, daily business. It was like turning over a page in a book of no concern. Uh, that was the way he decided he was going to get to the top. He was ruthless. He killed everybody. He even killed anybody who stood in his way. He came up uh, with a violent element, uh, cracked skulls, shook down uh, uh, merchants, uh, any way to make a buck. And if he used his fists, his gun, or a knife, he didn't care. Nobody stood in his way. Over his career, Genovese was charged with shooting a man in Queens, running down and killing a man in Brooklyn, and beating down whoever Masseria asked him to. He always had a loaded revolver tucked into his belt. Thomas Rapetto is the author of American Mafia. Well, the people that he worked with uh, were prone to violence, uh, almost by definition. And he understood that murders were bad for business. Uh, and so a lot of times he could stop unnecessary murders. Breaking, uh, breaking kneecaps, uh, violence was his keynote. Murder was, his, uh, murder was just a, uh, a ritual with him, of no, no concern, I had no conscience. Nobody would get in his way. If you did, he bumped you off, or he had somebody kill you. And he had no compunction about killing anybody. One example, even in romance, he was a killer. Uh, he actually he fell in love, his first wife died, and he fell in love with a cousin. And he was enamored of her, and she wouldn't get a divorce from her husband. What was Vito's uh, solution? You kill the husband. As simple as that. And you marry the wife. And that's what he did. So uh, as far as he was concerned, that was his number one uh, method of getting to the top. And it did. It worked for him. Genovese was not known for being intelligent, but someone like Luciano was good at recognizing people's talents. He soon employed Genovese as his personal hitman, Joe Coffey is a former NYPD officer. Vito Genovese rose to the top by intimidation, but also by being allowed to rise to the top by intimidation. And the guy who allowed him to do that was Lucky Luciano. Lucky Luciano used Vito Genovese as his intimidator. And he knew by being close to Luciano, which he was, he carried, don't forget, Luciano may have been looked very cultivated, but he, he needed hitmen. And when he needed hitmen, one of the first people he turned to was Vito Genovese, because he knew Genovese would carry it out or had the people, the strong guy people who had no compunction about it. So in that sense, he moved up in the organization. Uh, so this is how he got established in the organization. Castello was more adept at using his intelligence rather than violence to establish himself. By the 1930s, Frank Costello was known to the underworld as King of the Slots, his illegal one-armed bandit machines were grossing $500,000 a day. In New York, he had thousands of slot machines. Same kind of machines you now see in gambling casinos in America and elsewhere in the world. You drop in a coin, or now you use a card, and if you hit the lucky, uh, the lucky sequence, you're enriched. So he made millions. A lot of it, of course, went to Luciano's pocket, too, uh, but it, it established him as a good businessman, somebody who was known as an earner, not a guy who goes out and uh, has to commit hits or violent crimes. So he was pretty powerful in that sense that he could make a lot of dough uh, for what was considered white collar crime. And he also went into vending machines, things like that. Uh, the main he didn't get his kickbacks from what other people did in gambling or other uh, racketeering, and he liked labor racketeering too. So in that sense, he was the more modern gangster. Frank Costello personified it. He was emblematic, dressed well, 
acted very courteously, no loud voices, uh, never any confrontation with the police. He avoided arrest. All he was interested in was his outward appearance and making money and surviving. Costello was the very picture of a well-to-do gangster. Learning from Rothstein like his contemporaries, he wanted nothing more than to rub shoulders with the upper establishment. Well, Frank Costello was unusual as a, as a organized crime figure or a mafia figure, or whatever you want to call him, uh, in that he fashioned himself as a non-gangster. He fashioned himself as a businessman, uh, sometimes bordering on aristocracy. Uh, and he would rather run with the counts and dukes and earls than he would with the capos and the tutti capis and the rest of them. He'd like to be remembered as a member of the business community and, and an art patron. That was his act. He mixed with politicians, congressmen, journalists, authors, judges, cops, and city councilors, and soon became known as the Prime Minister of the Underworld. With his connections, Costello developed a reputation as the boss who could bridge the legitimate world and the mob. Frank Costello was called the Prime Minister because he was, that, that, that title was given to him by the media, by the newspapers and television, what have you. And the reason for that is that they likened, they likened him to our English ancestry in this country, where the famous prime minister of all was Winston Churchill, and they made Frank Costello the American Winston Churchill in the underworld. Thomas Frappetto. That doesn't mean that he was the boss of bosses. There was no such position, but he was first among equals and probably a little more equal than all the others. Uh, he was the one who made the political connections for the mob. He was the one who gave the shrewd advice. Uh, he was a very sharp thinker. Uh, the mob said he, he was the guy who could always figure the angles on every possible problem. So he was a man of great respect. And he had a lot of respectable friends. Both Castello and Genovese became more tied in with Luciano during the castella War in 1930, the war between two different factions of the mob family they all worked under. It ultimately ended when Luciano had Genovese kill boss Joe Masseria. Luciano soon took over the crime family. Genovese became his underboss, and Costello became his consigliere, his advisor. Ronald Goldstock is a former mafia investigator. There are two models for mob bosses. One is the, the, the traditional that fly below the radar, that recognize that they are criminals and they're only going to operate in the underworld. There are others who want to move past the underworld, be accepted by society, um, be viewed as something different than just a thug. Lucky Luciano used Vito Genovese as his intimidator. He also used Frank Costello as his diplomat. Genovese, who became the heir apparent to Luciana was not so sharp. Luci uh, Genovese was a real thug. Luciana would use intimidation if he had to, but he, pre he preferred Costello's approach. But he would use intimidation. For five years, Genovese served by Lucky Luciano's side, doing his dirty work without asking any questions, until one day an unexpected opportunity arose. Lucky Luciano was convicted on prostitution charges and sent to prison for 50 years. When Lucky uh, was convicted and sentenced to a long, long prison term, uh, the two competing characters were Vito Genovese and Frank Costello. Costello looked upon in his outward appearance as the gentleman gangster. And uh, Vito, he was the homicidal gangster, the nut, the maniac. No one would mess with him. Uh, but they were both, you know, profiting from all the rackets that the Luciano family had. That left the question, who would take over the family? Genovese was the underboss, so it fell to him. Thomas Repetto. Genovese was a ruthless individual, not well liked, and he was not a pleasant man to, to work with or for. Everybody preferred Costello, uh, but you know, business is business. And when one guy fails and the other guy appears to be succeeding, uh, 
because Genovese was very big in drugs and drugs was making a lot of money, whereas Costello wanted nothing to do with drugs. Then something happened that left the choice obvious. Genovese had been involved in a murder in 1934. The jury had been unable to prosecute, but now there was new evidence. But suddenly, somebody turned. There was a murder in Brooklyn, and the DA at that time in Brooklyn managed to get a squealer who implicated uh, Vito. The victim had been one of Genovese's gangsters who had demanded too big a share of a crooked card game. But only years later, just as he was about to take control of the Luciano family, did someone come forward. Vito saw that the game was up for a while in New York, and he decided the best thing to do was to scram and go back to Italy where he was a citizen. And he did so. Now, he knew he wasn't going to lose any money, because what he did was he still had his own crews working in New York, in gambling, in uh, rac labor racketeering, and uh, in, in, uh, shakedowns so he was doing pretty well and his new wife and he had couriers who brought over the money to him in Italy but what this did it opened the door to Frank Costello because Frank Costello's chief rival was now in Italy and he couldn't run it and uh, Costello could get his information or whatever his blessings from Lucky Luciano who was in prison so Costello is now in charge with Genovese now out of the picture Frank Costello became an even more powerful man. He was now the head of the Luciano family, the largest mob family in America, with more than 400 soldiers beneath him. Costello easily filled Luciano's shoes and continued to add billions of dollars to the family's fortunes. Costello um, had an urge to be accepted. Um, he was unwilling just to be a mobster like say, Vito Genovese, and the notion was that he could be in society, he could be viewed as an intelligent person who participated in um, all the kinds of things that people who had grown generationally within the United States were able to do. With the added power behind him, Costello was able to seed influence further into the heights of society, in politics and law. As far as politicians and judges and DAs and cops and the corrupt world that we lived in in those days, Frank Costello was the man behind all of it. He didn't just know judges and, and DAs and politicians, he bought them. And he was the original corrupter. No question about that, that was documented a thousand times. And the man was an absolute corrupter. Costello was a great camouflage. He showed you how powerful and how venomous the Mafia could be. He corrupted judges, he corrupted politicians. In effect, for almost 15 years, from the, uh, from the late 1930s into the 1950s, he ran the most powerful 